This video is brought to you by me. For $1 a month, you can support the channel directly and get access to exclusive content. Check out the link in the description below if you're interested. Thanks for supporting the channel. Every time you die and Travis strikes again, the game calls you a loser. And now that I've finished it, I wonder if what actually makes me a loser is finishing it at all. And that might sound harsh, but give me a bit to explain. I played this game back to back twice, once alone and once with my girlfriend. Travis Strikes Again has two different experiences when you play by yourself and with a friend, and I think the biggest flaw with it is, the game doesn't know what it is. It tries to be both a single player and multiplayer game, and it doesn't really pull off either. I didn't like the act of playing Travis Strikes Again alone, flat out. Of all the No More Heroes games, this is probably the one I knew most about before going in, just because of the reputation it had for repetitive gameplay and the small budget and the wholly different shift for the series, hence why this isn't No More Heroes 3, but rather, it's considered a spin-off. And while I'm aware this was never supposed to be a full entry in the series, I still saw people complaining about it because, tell me I'm wrong, but a lot of the time, after long absences from series, it sets up a spin-off for failure, despite it never promising to be a full-on entry in the first place. So I chalked up a lot of the disappointment with the game to fans wanting No More Heroes 3, and not this offshoot. I went in with optimism, ready to experience the game for what it actually was. It's very much its own thing, for better or for worse. I played Travis Strikes again after playing the original two games back to back because I wanted to experience the whole series before the actual third game comes out this year. And at first I was having a great time. The writing was everything I wanted it to be. It's funny and dripping with subtext left and right. And now that I waited a full on two years after the game was released to play it, there's even more to like about it. I was not expecting Dan Smith from Killer7 to show up in the intro sequence to give Badman the order to kill Travis Touchdown. After how much I loved that game, I was so excited to see him. But who is this new character, this Badman who is about to murder our protagonist? He's the father of Bad Girl, one of the assassins Travis kills in the first game. He's out for revenge, hunting Travis and trying to track him down. Upon Dan Smith's exit from Badman's apartment, he gives Badman a death ball for the mythical, Polybius-esque video game console, the Death Drive Mark II, used by the government to steal DNA of its users to create weaponized clones to replace American soldiers in wartime. And that's so hilariously dark that it's easy to laugh at and ignore that it's probably a future we're right around the corner from. Badman finally catches up to Travis living in an RV in the woods, on the run from his life and fame to travel and play video games. And as it would happen to turn out, Travis has in his possession the Death Drive Mark II, and is trying to unite the original six death balls that hold the games the console was supposed to launch with. Doing so will allow the holder to make one wish. Travis brings the console, and Badman brings the game, and instead of killing each other, they get sucked into the Death Drive and are forced to work together, if you have a second player, to beat each game. Badman's goal is to wait until Travis assembles all the death balls to wish his daughter back to life. Travis's wishes. Well, he just wants to play some hidden, cancelled games. The premise of all the games is simple, but it's the in-between that I found really interesting from this series. And the writing is still just as strong here, but this time it's raw and personal to Suda51. In some ways, it's a retrospective and an autobiography of sorts on Suda's experience through his career, the trials and tribulations of development and working with crappy publishers who crush creative vision, while also creating a captivating story where Travis goes into games and kills his video game heroes and draws the line between assassin and serial killer. It's a compelling narrative that I enjoyed profusely because it's a love letter to video games themselves, and especially the indie devs who are putting in the work. And you can see that with all the t-shirts you can unlock that feature indie games old and new. And long segments of Travis getting death balls are told through text-based digital movies that play out like an alternate version of the Metal Gear Solid codec. They have a tendency to drag on a bit, but I find them pretty enjoyable. However, this required bit is where the game becomes unfocused. The first time I played when I was playing alone, I loved reading these long sequences and lingering on every word and seeing the references to other games because it helped flesh out Travis's experience even more. But when you're playing alongside someone else, asking you to find someone else to care about these drawn out text segments is a pretty big ask. I honestly don't know anyone who has bought into the No More Heroes lore enough to care to sit and read these with me. Travis has to travel around the world to find the missing death balls, and seeing how he meets people and tracks them down while also directly breaking the fourth wall to complain about the amount of text on the screen wrangled quite a few chuckles out of me. 
Each of the Death Balls hold games that are homages to different eras of gaming and different parts of Suda's career, and the console announces itself like a Sega boot screen. I love the corny live-action FMV segments and the creative use of vector graphics to give the Death Drive a unique feel. Each game comes with its fair share of gimmicks that differentiate them from the others, and to me they were creative and unfortunately, they didn't lean far enough into being their own separate games. I would have liked to see more of these gimmicks fleshed out into more substance instead of just being momentary lapses in combat. They had the potential to be awesome, especially when the original idea for Travis Strikes Again was supposed to be multiple teams of indie devs creating their own death drive balls for different feels and mechanics. But what we get is something less interesting. Once you get past the gimmick of moving neighborhood tiles to get to a goal, you fight waves and waves of enemies. When you lose a race in Golden Dragon GP, you have to get new parts by fighting waves of enemies. You don't need a third example, you get the idea. It's a real pity that I found the core gameplay so incredibly tedious when playing alone, especially the fact that it's honestly more complex than the games that came before it. Travis and Badman, as well as all the other DLC characters that came with the season pass, all play really similar to each other with the only real differentiators being health, damage, and range of attack. Every character has a quick attack, weak attack, and a slow heavy attack that if hit in rapid succession, unleashes an even stronger attack. You can also dodge and jump, which if you combine the jump and the attack, it does a dive attack. These baseline attacks get stale very quickly. The light attack looks like I did when I was five years old running around with a lightsaber, aimless and ineffective at doing anything but being annoying. For mowing down enemies in the early game, it works fine, but it becomes totally useless as enemies get stronger. Yes, you can level up your stats with experience, and I still found myself leaning on the heavy attacks because the amount of damage from those is five to 10 times higher than the light attack. But travel with me down memory lane for a second, back to No More Heroes. Even the weakest, most filler enemies require different strategies for killing them. If they block, you can kick them and stun them and hit them with a suplex, or you had a high and low attack to hit them opposite of where they were blocking. The core of Travis Strikes Again is just mashing heavy attack while running around enemies and occasionally hitting the R bumper to do a super attack. It's too simple. And if you play with a friend, the repetition doesn't feel as bad because you take out enemies twice as quickly. It helps the game feel less repetitive because you make progress much quicker. Because the gameplay feels like it was made for multiplayer. But alone, this starts to get grindy really quick as waves of enemies last longer than they should to the point where you're getting fatigued on the battle system in the first couple hours. The only real change in gameplay comes in the form of chips, which are equipable skills that are assigned to each of the face buttons. They require recharge after use, so you use one and you have to wait for a cooldown before you can use it again, and this adds the only real strategy to the game. The only problem is, when I was playing alone, I found four skill chips and used them the entire time. I didn't feel the need to use other chips because I'd try them out, realize they didn't do anything to help me wipe out enemies faster, and then go back to the few I got really early on. A lot of the criticism I saw with Travis Strikes Again is that the game is too easy, and maybe that's true. But I don't think that's the whole story. I think No More Heroes 2 is too easy, but it's still fun. Travis Strikes Again is mindless. Even the boss fights, which I found to be the most compelling part of the game, all felt really similar to each other. Just wait for the opportunity to slash and avoid attacks when the boss decides to attack you. And to me, that's the most disappointing part of the whole thing. The tedious and repetitive hacking and slashing washes away the excellent writing and interesting surrounding elements of the death balls and the unique games and scenarios Suda crafted for each in-world game. And the problem is, the only way to make the gameplay more interesting is to play with someone else, which means you're going to have to rush through the text sections, the best part of the game. So you have to pick your poison. Do you choose to play alone, have a dull time playing the game but enjoy the writing? Or do you choose to have fun with the game and play with a friend and blitz through the text sections and miss the story entirely? And even then, say you have someone who is totally into No More Heroes and you want to read every single word together. Great, you're in for a really good time, but there are still segments of the game that were clearly built for one player focus. Take for instance Coffee and Donuts where the gimmick is platforming on donuts. I did this segment with no problem on my first try when I was playing alone. But because the donuts are small and the camera was inconsistent, my girlfriend and I had a terrible time with this. Golden Dragon GP can't even be done in two-player mode, so one person has to wait while the other person does the races alone. 
Are you starting to get the picture and see what I mean about this game not really knowing if it's supposed to be a single player game or a multiplayer experience? I'm not trying to bash this game that a team of 10 creative people worked on because it's a miracle that any game is made at all, let alone one that is made by such a small team, but I'm just trying to express how let down I am by a game in a series that is so well known for its tight, fun combat to bring such a boring combat system to the table. I understand the move to pixels over blood and gore, and I understand the tongue-in-cheek nods to why cuts were made due to budget restrictions, but I don't understand how the combat system became so dull. And that's not a knock against top-down games, I never judge a game by their camera angles, and honestly, for as ready as I was for this game to be over by the first time I played it, I would absolutely be on board for a sequel to this game that fleshes out the combat more for each character, and more chips would be effective for different enemies, I think it could be awesome. I've seen the sentiment that Travis strikes again as a cash grab. I think that's incredibly short-sighted. It's an incredibly authentic dedication to gaming if you look at anything past the gameplay. For me, it's another game on this channel that is greater than the sum of its parts, and it's worth playing for the writing and the love letter aspect alone. It won't be for everyone, and that's the problem. This game is for people who are fans of No More Heroes, who also have friends who are also into No More Heroes. Unfortunately, if you want to have fun with it, you need to find someone who cares as much as you do who will want to read these walls of text in the game, and that's not going to be easy for everyone, including me. If you're a fan of Travis Touchdown and want to learn more about him and his journey after the second game, you might be able to overlook the gameplay just to spend more time with him. But especially if you've never played a No More Heroes game before, you're going to find it hard to get past. Anyway, thank you so much for watching my video, I really appreciate you making it this far into it. If you liked the video, please consider leaving a like on it. Did you play Travis Strikes again? What did you think of it? Let me know in the comments down below. If you want to see more of my videos, be sure to hit the subscribe button and hit the bell to make sure you're never missing one of my uploads. Lastly, if you want to support the channel directly, you can check out my Patreon link in the description below. For $1 a month, you can get access to exclusive content you can't find anywhere else. I'd also like to take a moment and mention my higher tier members Sebastian Pereira, Andrew Lang, and 8-Bit Jesus. See you in the next video. Bye.